to serve. Okay. We are now going to discuss the narcissist's interpersonal relationships. In other words, with other people. Um, I mentioned before, hopefully some of you remember, if you're not dissociating throughout this lecture, which I didn't blame you, uh, that the narcissist uses the same methodology, the same structures, the same dynamics, and the same techniques in all relationships. Whenever external objects are involved that are internalized. So it could be anything from colleague to intimate partner and so on. And the shocking thing for all of you, perhaps, is that the narcissist does not see a difference between an intimate partner and a colleague, a boss and a child, mom. Therefore, the narcissist does not choose you as his intimate partner. There's no choice involved here. You're all dispensable, interchangeable, commoditized, You're like so many grains of rice. The narcissist doesn't care if you are empathic, because he doesn't do empathy. He doesn't care if you're kind and nice. He doesn't care about any of these things that you see online when victims self-aggrandized. The Nazis chose me because I'm amazingly empathetic. I'm super gal galactic empathism. <laughs> super nobody. This is all nonsense. The Nazis is interested in four things. They are known, or I call them the four S's. Four S's are sex, of course, um, services, uh, safety, and supply. The two types of supply narcissistic supply and sadistic supply. A small minority of narcissists are sadists. So they derive pleasure from inflicting pain. And this is a form of supply, not sadistic supply. These are the four S's. If you provide two of the four S's, two, any two, you qualify. So if you provide sex and services, it goes, you got the job. If you provide services and safety, you got the job, etc. So it's also not true that the narcissist insists on the totality of the package, all the four. Narcissist therefore is, in this sense, antisocial. He is goal-oriented, exactly like the psychopath. In intimate relationships, in all relationships, but in intimate relationships, the narcissist is goal-oriented. What can you do for him? What can you give him? Who you are <laughs> is utterly irrelevant. That's why narcissists never envy you. It's not true. They don't envy you, because they're superior to you, of course. God doesn't envy humans, for example. So you must get rid of a lot of this nonsense. You are a production unit, equivalent of a refrigerator, or a television set, or a laptop. You're a production unit. Now, of course, most narcissists don't have sex with their laptops. It's very dangerous with electricity. But still, you understand what I'm saying. These are Functional units. Okay. Now, the, the deal that the narcissist offers you is a bad deal. I mean, who wants to be a service provider? Essentially, he's offering you to be a service provider. Who wants to do this? No one wants to do this. So he has, and again, everything he does, everything the narcissist does, is not intentional, is not premeditated, and very often is not conscious. Narcissists are not psychopaths. Psychopaths are premeditated. Psychopaths are intentional. Psychopaths have plans and goals, not narcissists. Um, narcissists do everything automatically. I would compare narcissists, for example, to a virus. A virus has a purpose, has a goal. This is known as teleology. Yes, it's a teleolo teleological assumption. So a virus is a goal, obviously, to penetrate a cell, to replicate in the cell, etc., etc. By the way, the virus doesn't have any goal to kill the cell, but to replicate. But we wouldn't say that the virus is doing this on purpose. It is intentional. So we should not confuse intentionality with purposefulness. The narcissist is purposeful, of course, because he needs to secure favorable outcomes. He needs to be self-efficacious, but he is not intentional like the psychopath. Everything he does is almost automated, almost automatic. And what he does is called the shared fantasy. 
It's a way to lure you, to attract you into a honey trap and then to prevent you from exiting. And this is done in a diabolically sophisticated manner. Mm -hmm. But many processes in nature, which are not self-aware processes, not conscious processes, are diabolically efficient. Many. I mentioned viruses, but not only. So you can say narcissism is not a virus, it's not a tiger, because he knows right from wrong. And yes, but when he implements the plan of attracting you, captivating you, capturing you, converting you into a hostage, sucking your <laughs> lifeblood and so on, he doesn't do this um, in terms of right and wrong. He does it more like nutrition. He has to eat. It's a predator, in other words. Simply a predator. So stop thinking about narcissism in terms of a morality play. Good versus evil, you know, angels versus demons. This is medieval. We don't, there's also no place for this in psychology, clinical psychology. There was a guy called Scott Peck, totally insane. And Scott, Scott Peck, and I mean, he was totally crazy. And Scott Peck uh, wrote a book where he said that the modern uh, expression and modern reification of evil is narcissism. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's nice, <coughs> but it's, it's not psychology. Hmm? So here's what the narcissist does. But before we go there, as usual, <laughs> I have to say something. I have to introduce you to the to a concept that I developed that, that I called the whole of mirrors. Mm -hmm. The whole of mirrors. Victims of narcissists think that they fall in love with the narcissist. They don't. Because you can't fall in love with an absence, with a void, with a black hole. There's no ability to affect, to emotionally invest in that which is not there, in a nothingness. This is <laughs> absurd. So what are you falling in love with? With yourselves. You're falling in love with yourselves. <laughs> You're falling in love with the way the narcissist sees you, with the way the narcissist claims to love you. You're falling in love with the interaction between you and the narcissist that renders you ideal and perfect. So I call it the whole of mirrors. The narcissist lures you into the carnival, the narcissistic carnival, and there's a whole of mirrors. And you enter the whole of mirrors and you see a thousand reflections of yourself. But they're not real. They're idealized reflections. In these reflections, you're perfection. You're amazing. You're drop dead gorgeous. You are super intelligent. You're unprecedented. Perfect. And Narcissus tells you nothing like that has ever happened to me before. You're the you're the love of my life. What I experienced with you, I've never experienced with anyone else. And so he renders you ideal. And we all have a self-love deficit, including in modern, including healthy people in modern society, a self-love deficit. And here the narcissist allows you to experience for the first time, maybe for many, for many people it's for the first time, allows you to experience self-love. Because now you can fall in love with yourself. Why? Because you're perfect. You're perfect. We learn, many of us, even healthy people, we learn what is called performative love. Love that is dependent on performance. Conditional love. I'm going to love you if you're a good girl. I'm going to love you if you're a good boy. Mother tells you. Father tells you. You learn that love is a means of exchange. You provide performance and you get love. The performance could be defined differently in different families. Of course. But it's always a trade, it's always transactional. And the narcissist comes and offers you the opportunity to revisit your, your childhood, to experience unconditional love. Why unconditional? Because you're already perfect. You don't have to perform. As you are, you're perfect. We need to perform when we are not perfect. We need to perform when we are imperfect, so that we become perfect. The need to perform means something is missing. We need to do something. 
So when there is a demand, a parental demand to perform the hidden message, the occult messages, you are not good as you are. As you are, you're inadequate, you're insufficient. You need to improve on yourself, or you need to change, or you need to not be you. You need to not be you. I want you to be a good boy. Message, you're not a good boy. Mm -hmm. no? So you need to not be you. This is self-denial and self-negation, which is extremely common in parenting all over the world, even in totally healthy and functional normal family. And here comes a narcissist and says, you need to do nothing. By virtue of your existence, you're perfect. You're ideal. So this is the whole of mirrors. You fall in love with yourself, with your reflection, through the narcissist's gaze, through the narcissist's eyes. You're beginning to see something very interesting. The narcissist replicates with you the deficiencies in his own upbringing, in his own childhood. The narcissist did not enjoy a mother's gaze, so he provides you with a mother's gaze. The narcissist was not able to separate from mother, so he would attempt to separate from you, as you will see. It is as if the narcissist recreates his childhood with you and helps you to recreate your childhood with him. It's a principle called dual mothership. I will come to it in a minute. Okay. So this is the whole mirrors. And um, I have to go back a bit to um, the process of early childhood. It's to understand the shared fantasy, which I'll discuss in a minute, we, you, would, you would need to understand the dynamics in childhood. So what happens in childhood? A baby is born. Now raising babies sucks. It's a horrible thing. Babies are horrible. Absolutely horrible. I'm not going to details. Say it again. <laughs> Mothers are so happy. <laughs> yes. I will not say it again. I know I raised my brothers and sisters from scratch. So it was the biggest trauma of my life. So it's really, really difficult. And so one third of mothers develop depression, postnatal depression. Today we know the real figures. These figures were hidden many, many decades, but now we know. About one third develop uh, uh, postnatal depression and uh, anxiety disorders. One third. And most mothers, if not all mothers, idealize the baby. That's the initial phase. They are not later. They, later, they don't continue with the idealization. Remember, they give the baby a realistic picture. But initially, to raise the baby, to adapt to the new situation, which puts enormous stress and strain on the relationships, on the career, the price is huge. To adapt to this, the mother idealizes the baby. It's a process of idealization. This idealization continues usually until 18 months. Because the mother idealizes the baby, the baby has develops grandiosity. The baby experiences the whole of mirror effect. The baby sees itself through the mother's gaze. And through the mother's gaze, the baby is perfect. So the baby develops grandiosity. It is this grandiosity that allows the baby to separate from mother and to explore the world. Because think about it, you're two years old, and you tell mother, I'm independent, and I'm free, and I'm going to explore the world. You need to be seriously grandiose to do this. Mm -hmm. And this grandiosity derives from the idealization of the mother. So the mother becomes what is known as a secure base. The baby is not afraid to lose mother if he says goodbye to her and begins to discover other people in a process known as object relations, okay? Such children, when the mother allows them to separate, develop secure attachment style. When the mother does not allow separation, there's insecure attachment style. Okay, now, the concept of shared fantasy, again, to my huge regret, was not invented by me was invented by Sander, S-A-N-D-E-R, in 1989. Sander came up with this concept of shared fantasy and applied it to healthy, normal relationships. 
some backing applied it to narcissistic abuse and abusive relationships. So this adaptation is mine, but the concept is his. And uh, it involves fantasy, of course, shared fantasy. What is a fantasy? In psychoanalytic theory, a fantasy is a defense. It's a defense mechanism. Why? What does it defend against? Reality, of course. Fantasy defends against reality. In a way, it's good because fantasy allows you, for example, to daydream, to plan, to imagine things. Okay, so fantasy is a good thing. But if fantasy takes over, if it metastasizes, if it becomes a total alternative to reality, which is much more appealing than reality, then, of course, it's pathological. And the shared fantasy is a pathological fantasy. The thing, in, the thing in, uh, about fantasy is that it's addictive. It has elements of addiction. And so you could have a fantasy about a person, and this is known as person-centered fantasy, exactly the equivalent of, of uh, person-centered addiction. Or you could have a process, a fantasy about a process, so this is known as a process-focused fantasy, compare, comparable to process addiction. Okay, so it's, but it's addictive. Why is it addictive? Because again, reality sucks. Reality sucks. And if you think you are not living in fantasy, then you are living in fantasy. Because you're all living in fantasy, of course. Every time you open the television, you're in fantasy. Actually watching a movie, believe it or not, involves extreme dissociation. Do you know why you jump in a horror movie? Because you're inside the horror movie. You're dissociating. And fantasy in today's world was not the case, let's say, 100 years ago, 150 years, but in today's world, fantasy definitely has replaced reality in many ways. So we have a general situation of pathological fantasy. Now, the shared fantasy between the narcissist and his intimate partner. I'm taking this as an example, yes? The shared fantasy between narcissists and the intimate partner is first of all shared. We, we all tend to ignore the shared part because the victims of narcissistic abuse, the survivors of such relationships and so on, they want to exonerate themselves. They want to say, I am not guilty. I didn't do anything wrong. I was the passive recipient of evil intentions and evil actions. It's not my fault. I did not contribute anything to my predicament. And that's, of course, counterfactual. It's actually a fantasy. It's a fantasy defense. The shared fantasy is a full-fledged, full-scale collaboration between the narcissist's intimate partner and the narcissist, each for their own reasons. Each for their own reasons. And each couple, each dyad, is, requires a different, as a highly specific and idiosyncratic analysis. So we cannot generalize. But the rule is that the partner collaborates with the narcissist, colludes with the narcissist, conspires with the narcissist to create a common fantasy. What is this reminiscent of? A cult. It's the equivalent of a cult. This fantasy is inward looking, it excludes the world, and it has its own narratives, which are counterfactual, they defy the facts, and narratives which are very often paranoid, and narratives that uh, are grandiose in majority of cases. And the partner of the narcissist fully collaborates with all this. For example, she encourages the narcissist to be grandiose. She enhances the narcissist's grandiosity. She colludes with the narcissist in excluding all others, or criticizing all others, or demeaning and debasing all others. Um, she conspires with the narcissist to adopt unrealistic goals about, I don't know, marriage or children or, or financial plans or business plans or, or whatever. So there's a lot of collaboration and collusion. And when victims would tell you, I have been deceived, the narcissist is a great actor. I didn't know what was happening until the last moment. And when I discovered, I exited the, the whatever it was. 
That's unfortunately untrue. Actually, we have studies that show that when you're in the presence of a narcissist, within minutes, you develop something known as uncanny valley reaction. It's a, a sense of discomfort and ill at ease, as if the person you're with, who happens to be the narcissist, is not fully human. Something wrong, something off key, something put together wrongly, wrong manufacturing, you know? Now, the uncanny valley reaction was first described of course, by a Japanese in 1970, Masahiro Mori, a roboticist. Masahiro Mori said, as robots will become more and more human, we're going to, become, we're going to begin to feel more and more discomfort, more, more and more ill at ease. The more the robot resembles humans, the, the, the worse we will feel in the presence of the robot. And this is the uncanny value reaction. And everyone has it in the presence of Nazis. So why, why do many people claim to have been deceived? Because they suppress it. They deny it. They don't want to recognize it. For example, if you're very, very, very lonely, then you would tell yourself all kinds of stories about the narcissist. You say, ah, it's nothing. It's... Otherwise, he's a great guy. Yeah, he's, he's misbehaving here, but otherwise, he's a great guy. You will convince yourself. You create narratives to push yourself into the fantasy. So it's a collusion. It's a collaboration. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. And it has seven stages. Stage one, co-idealization. Co-idealization is when the narcissist idealizes you. He tells you that you're perfect, you're amazing, etc., etc., what I mentioned before. And this idealizes him. Because, for example, if I own a Ferrari, it says something about me. If my partner is perfect, drop-dead gorgeous, amazingly intelligent, it says something about me that she is my partner. Right? It idealizes me. So that's a process of co-idealization. The partner enters this phase because she loves to be idealized. It's a bit narcissistic. Don't tell anyone. So the feeling of being idealized, the feeling of being perceived as perfect, is intoxicating. It's addictive. And anyone who has exited a relationship with a narcissist would tell you this. She misses this. She misses the focused attention, the love bombing, the amazing uh, concentration on, on herself, on her needs, on her history, on everything. It's like she's the center of the world. She's the most amazing creature to have ever been created, except somebody. So, you know, it's addictive, it's intoxicating. And it allows the narcissist to idealize himself. Because as usual with the narcissist, it's all about himself. Never lose sight of this. It's all about himself. Even when he idealizes you, it's in order to idealize himself. To say, I own an ideal object that makes me ideal. Okay? So this is co-idealization. The second stage is the dual mothership. The dual mothership is a covert contract. It's a contract, but unknown to you. And the contract says, you're going to be my mother, and I'm going to be your mother, not father. Everyone asks me online, can it be father? No, it cannot be father. The psychodynamic role, of, the psychological role of a father is very different to the psychological role of a mother. The father has to do with acquiring skills, socialization, later in life. The father comes into play around age three. That's why many single parent families with single mothers, raise healthy children without a father. The unpleasant truth for us males is that we are not needed until age three, four. Probably. So the, there's new dual mothership. The narcissist tells you, sort of communicates to you subliminally. It's, it's not you know, open. He says, I'm going to love you unconditionally. I'm going to idealize you. I'm going to let you experience maternal love as you should have experienced it and did not experience it. With me, you will experience it. I will love you like you've never been loved before. And all I want you is to be my mother. I want you to love me the same way. I want you to love me unconditionally. I want you to accept all my behaviors. I want, so it tests. It tests you. It tests you 
with narcissistic abuse. He pushes the envelope. He behaves egregiously. His misconduct skyrockets. He abuses you. He maltreats you. He attacks you. He criticizes you. All the time, testing, will you continue to love me? Will you love me despite my misbehavior? It's a test. It's a mother who tests. And this is the, there is, here at this stage, there is dual messaging. You're perfect, you're ideal, you're godlike, you're amazing, you're drop dead gorgeous, okay? But I'm gonna abuse you. I'm gonna attack you, I'm gonna criticize you. So this creates dissonance, yes? There is, the, at this stage of the dual mothership, the victim begins to experience dissonance. And the narcissist tests the victim, but that's a self-limiting test. At some point, the narcissist says, she passed all the tests, she can be my mother. And at that point, in the relationship, there are two mothers. The narcissist is your mother, and you are his mother. And you both love each other unconditionally, and you both accept each other, without any reservations, without any limitations, without any boundaries, and so on and so forth. In other words, you recreate what Mahler called the symbiotic stage. You become one. You merge, you fuse. your single organism with two heads. And this is stage number two, the dual mother. The next stage, the narcissist converts you into a mother in order to reenact or recreate the early childhood with his dead mother. So he's trying to find a substitute mother, a good mother. But wait a minute, do you remember what a good mother does? Pushes the child away. For the narcissist to conceive of you as a good mother, he needs to separate from you. If he doesn't separate from you, you're just another bad mother. You're exactly like his mother. His mother didn't separate from him, didn't allow him to separate. He needs you to allow him to separate. In order to prove that you are a good mother, and that's the sad irony of the shared fantasy, because the devaluation and the discard phases, the phases of breakup, are baked into the shared fantasy. They are the reason for the shared fantasy. The narcissist embarks on romantic relationships in order to divorce you in order to break up you. That's the goal of the shared fantasy. And victims don't understand this. They keep asking themselves, could I have behaved differently? Did I do anything wrong? Or maybe he is evil, he is malicious, he, you know, he didn't see my he didn't see my value, he didn't understand that I'm perfect for him. My love could have transformed him. All kinds of nonsense. The narcissist chose you to become his next mother. And he needs a good mother, because his previous mother was a bad mother. And he needs a good mother. And a good mother normally breaks up with her child, no? That's the definition of a good mother. And so he needs to break up with her. And this starts by something uh, which I call the mental discard. He begins to transfer. So, before we go there, when the narcissist meets you and decides that you could be his intimate partner, you remember what he does? He creates an internal object. He snapshots you. He introjects you. He creates, a, he creates a representation in his mind that stands in for you, that is you. He continues to interact with this internal object, never with you. That's another common mistake of victims. <coughs> he snapshots you, introjects you, and all his future interactions are with the internal object, never with you. He's incapable of perceiving external object, anyhow. So he continues to interact with the snapshot, with the internal object. And now comes the phase where he has decided that you love him unconditionally, as a mother should, that you are a good mother, and therefore you are a secure base. It is safe to separate from you. Safe to separate from you. All this process takes place inside his mind, not with you. So you are not aware of all this. It comes as a shock, because there's no external interaction. It's all happening inside. And so he says, okay, she's a good mother, time to separate. And he begins 
to change, to transform the internal uh, object that represents you. It doesn't transform you. You don't exist. It transforms the internal object. It transitions the internal object from idealized to persecutory. It makes you, in short, an enemy. An enemy. It's called persecutory object. This is fourth phase? This is the third phase. Third phase. Third phase. The mental third phase. So in preparation for the separation, he converts you from ideal, perfect, etc. He converts you to an enemy. So now you're an enemy in his mind, but not yet in reality, because he doesn't interact with external object. And you begin to feel strange because of this mixed messaging. You know? It all takes place in his mind. But then there's a problem. He idealized you. He has idealized you. Now, he has con he's converting you into an enemy. What does it mean? He has been wrong about you. He's been wrong. If you're an enemy, then you should not have been idealized in the first place. There's a mistake here. And one thing narcissists never do, especially me, is admit <laughs> to a mistake. They are never wrong. Mm -hmm. They're what we call infallible. Mm -hmm. They're like the Pope, only worse. They're infallible. So the narcissist cannot admit that he has made a mistake in having idealized you. So this creates internal narcissistic injury. The narcissist is wounded by his own machinations. He, he cannot reconcile. The, he doesn't know how to explain. How did he make this, uh, this mistake? And so in order to explain this to himself and to restore his grandiosity, because the narcissistic injury is a challenge to the grandiosity. But grandiosity, for you to understand, is a cognitive distortion. It's a misperception of reality. It's an impairment in reality testing. So, am I going too fast? No. A little too fast? <laughs> okay, so you understand that when he converts you from ideal to a secretary, it presents a problem because it means he's made a mistake. So to solve this, to solve this, to restore his grandiosity, he has to devalue you. He has to he has to convince himself that you have been like that. Uh, you have been, I'm sorry, you have been, when he idealized you, you have been like that, but something happened. For example, you are under the influence of bad friends, or something biological happened to you, some disease, you are, you are having some brain disease or something, or uh, your mother died and it affected you in ways that changed your psychology. You have changed, you are not the same. The person you idealized is not the person that is now a persecutory object. She, she has changed. He does not change. He's perfection. He stands still because he doesn't need to move. But you have changed. So he needs to devalue you. And that is the explanation for devaluation. Devaluation is an attempt to match the external object with a new persecutory internal object. So that he can explain to himself that he did not get it wrong. He did not commit a mistake. But you're not the same person. Same thing. You're mentally ill now, maybe. Physically ill, both. And so on and so forth. He will find, will find in your history or autobiography or personal circumstances, you will find some explanation. You will you say, you see, uh, since you started to be friends with uh, X, you are not the same person. She has bad influence on you. Or, I don't know, uh, um, you are now interested in uh, music, and when we met, you were interested in history, like me. So you have, you have changed. He was constant. He was loyal. He was always there for you. He was you who have changed. So he devalues to restore grandiose. The secretary object now matches the external object. Whenever there is a discrepancy between the external object and the internal object, 
this creates dissonance. Even, if the, even though the narcissist cannot perceive the separateness and externality of the external object, still, the narcissist cannot deny reality infinitely. So if, for example, he, he developed the, the belief or the idealized view that you are the most loyal partner imaginable, that he can trust you fully and, and you're super reliable, and, and then the next thing he knows, you're having an affair with your boss. I mean, there's a limit how much you can deny reality. Narcissists are, after all, not fully psychotic. It's not a question of total divorce. So the limit, if you cross this limit, it creates dissonance. The divergence and deviance between the idealized object and you, if it becomes too big, it creates dissonance. Similarly, if the divergence between you and the persecutory object is too big, it creates dissonance. For example, if the persecutory object is that you are cheating on him, and yet he never succeeds to prove it. Or if the persecutory object is, uh, I don't know, you're not taking care of him, and yet you are taking care of him, hand and foot, day and night. This creates dissonance. And he will try to push you to not take care of him, to cheat on him. This is known as projective identification. He will push you in ways, to behave in ways that affirm, that support the devalued persecutory object. So many narcissists push their partners to cheat. This is known as the betrayal fantasy. Because this confirms, this, then it matches, the external object matches with the internal object, and there's no dissonance. This is the next thing. And then, at this stage, the narcissist is ready. You, are, you loved him unconditionally, like a mother does. Uh, you idealized him, co-idealized him, like a mother does. You're a good mother, you survived his narcissistic abuse with flying colors. Uh, and then he prepared to separate from you, he converted you into a persecutory object, so there's good reason to separate. You're cheating on him, you're not loyal, you're not taking care of him, there's a good reason to separate, yeah? So now he's ready to separate from you, and the separation is known as discard. It's a, a word that I coined, by the way. I call this word this card. 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 This this is the fifth. Fifth, fifth, fifth. 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 And now the narcissist is ready. The narcissist is ready to separate from his good mother. This time it should work. The bad mother did not allow him to separate. But this is a good mother. He proved it to himself. He cannot separate from you as a mother. Because he's not a child. You're not a child. I mean, so he needs to divide you. That's his way to separate from you. And now he can separate from you, and he feels safe to separate from you, because you're a secure base. He feels safe, he feels justified, he feels that it's okay to discard you. It's okay to separate from you. And so he, he separates from you. It could be physical, but doesn't have to be physical. It could be emotional, for example. Emotional absence. It could be staying with you and having affairs. It could be sabotaging your coexistence, your life together, in a variety of ways. So it doesn't have to be physical separation. That's another common mistake. It's simply absenting himself, removing himself from the scene, and destroying the intimacy. There's a campaign to destroy the intimacy in numerous ways. And this is the discard, and this is a symbolic reenactment of the separation that should have happened with the original mother and never happened. And here he separates. But <laughs> this is a psychological cost. Everything is a psychological cost. This is a psychological cost. The minute he discards the partner, the minute he separates from the partner, 
he has several psychological reactions. The first one is known as separation insecurity. This is the clinical term, and the colloquial term online is abandonment anxiety. Abandonment anxiety is not a clinical term. So he experiences abandonment anxiety because remember, he's getting rid of mother. Mahler, Margaret Mahler, explained that the child who separates from mother experiences abandonment anxiety and then runs back to mother in a process called rapprochement. So this is absolutely the correct way to separate individually. You separate, you experience abandonment anxiety, and you run back to mother. Run back to mother to test whether mother still loves you, despite the fact that you have discarded her. Does she still love you? And this is a process known as hoovering. So, hoovering is the adult version, adult narcissistic version of uh, rapprochement. Testing whether he's still loved, still has a place in your heart, despite the fact they made your life hell, converted you into an enemy, and shot your dog. <laughs> At that point, there's a problem. So the shared fantasy is very intricate. It's a very intricate mechanism. But I hope that you see how it fits well with so many phenomena in relationships with narcissists. So as far as I know, and not because I invented it, I did not. Sander invented it. As far as I know, this is the best explanation to all the phenomena that we are aware of in relationships with narcissists. There are other explanations, but they don't explain everything. They explain point one, point seven, point six, but nothing explains everything. Only this. So it's pretty safe to assume that this is what's happening. Also, any partner of narcissists will tell you that she had to act as a mother at some point. There were maternal functions somehow involved. Maybe not all the time, but there were maternal expectations at some point. So. When the discard is completed, there's abandonment anxiety, which leads to hovering. Hovering is an attempt to re-establish a shared fantasy. Yeah. But there's another phenomenon. Remember that the narcissist converted the internal object that represents you from ideal to persecutor, to enemy. Yeah. When he gets rid of you, he, get, he remains stuck with the object, with the internal object. Mm -hmm. Your gun but the internal object is there. By the way, same thing happens to you as victim of narcissism. Mm -hmm. The narcissist's gun is introjected in your head. And in order to heal from narcissistic abuse, you need to get rid of the introject, and you need, you need to go through separation individuation. Because remember the dual mothership. What is a dual mothership? The narcissist tells you, I will be your mother, but for the narcissist to be your mother, you need to become a child. The narcissist regresses you, infantilizes you. So you, you go back to being a baby. And he goes, he is a baby, and you're a baby. These are two babies pretending to be mothers, each other's mothers. So when the narcissist exits your life, thankfully, you remain stuck is you, are, you remain as an infant. You're an infant. Mm -hmm. And you actually need to go through separation, individuation, as an infant does. So the only way to heal from narcissistic abuse is to get rid of the introject, there are ways to do this, and to separate, individuate from the maternal figure of the narcissist. And only then you can proceed to restoring your adult identity. So same happens to the narcissist. You're stuck in his head. There's an introject of you in his head. And it's a bad one. It's an evil one. It's an enemy one. You're his enemy. And of course, I don't need to tell you that when you have such an internal object, <coughs> it's very threatening. It creates, in other words, anxiety. It's anxiogenic. This kind of internal object in your head creates anxiety, and anxiety leads to paranoid ideation. That's the secret. So, when you're gone physically from the narcissist's life, he remains stuck with a vision of you as his enemy. 
And this vision generates anxiety and dissonance, and later, paranoid ideation. He begins to suspect you of conspiring against him, doing bad things, and, and so on and so forth. Even when you are really outside, out, his life, out of his life, when you're not in contact, no contact strategy, which I designed in the 90s, even then, you're still there as an internal, a threatening internal object. Threatening and frustrating internal object. This you cannot get rid of. And he's stuck with this. So, what can he do about this? He, he has only one option. He needs to, he has two options actually. He needs to re-idealize you. He needs to convert the persecutory object back to an idealized, non-threatening, maternal object. He needs to do this. And this is done in the process of hovering. The process of hovering, attempting to re-establish the shared fantasy, the narcissist re-idealizes you. So a month before the hovering, he told you that you're a bitch, you're a, you're a thief, you're disloyal, and you deserve to die under the uh, an 18-wheel truck. Usually it's an 18-wheel truck. He tells you this a month before. And a month later, you're again the most amazing Perfect, super beautiful. Uh, and so he re idealizes it. He changes the internal object back from the secretary to ideal, but then he must have you in his life. Remember, all the, the principle is the external object must conform to the internal object. Not because the narcissist interacts with the external object, but because there's a limit to how much reality he can deny. So, if he re-idealizes you, you need to be in his life again in a maternal capacity. Shared fantasy has to be re-established. And this is the seventh stage. Now, another option is when the narcissist, of course, finds a replacement, a substitute. But then something very interesting uh, would happen. The substitute would be snapshotted, introjected, and there would be an ideal object which represents her, an ideal internal object which represents her. And there will be your the secretary object, which survives in his mind. So he would have in his mind an ideal object <coughs> and a persecutory object. And if he doesn't resolve the situation, there will be war, or dissonance, or conflict, internal conflict between these two objects. So what he does, and very, very few victims or intimate partners are aware of this, what he does, he merges the objects. So he idealizes the new um, mother in your form. He would tend to idealize her as you. And um, this is a very uh, interesting process. He's kind of merging all the internal objects so as to avoid the persecutory dissonance. So a narcissist would select one intimate partner, uh, de idealize or devalue her, get rid of her. And would move on to another. And then he would idealize that new source, that new intimate partner, but he would talk about her in terms that actually describe you. He would idealize you, her, as if she were you. And there would be a huge discrepancy between the new idealization and the real object. So, for example, if you are truly beautiful, okay, you're truly beautiful, and he idealized you, he said, you're amazingly gorgeous, and I don't know what. And then his next sketch is how to be gentle, less than, uh, uh, less than a looker. I won't say ugly. Less than a look, le less than good looking. He would still idealize her as drop dead gorgeous. He would carry over your idealization to her in order to avoid dissonance. And this becomes more and more divorced from reality as the narcissist goes through repeated shared fantasies until finally he is totally divorced from reality. And then this kind of narcissist can fall prey to a psychopath or to a gold digger. He's so divorced that it, the interaction is totally in his mind and he doesn't pay attention that he's being conned and you know, he really comes across an enemy or to say a truly evil person who takes advantage of the narcissist. Yeah. This is because the divorce between reality and fantasy grows all the time. The more 
the more intimate partners the narcissist discards, the harder he has to work to merge these internal objects to avoid conflict and dissonance, and the further away from reality the idealization is, until finally it has nothing to do with reality. And then the narcissist is entirely inside his, his mind, and he is helpless. He is truly helpless then as a child. He is helpless. And then he is easy prey. He becomes, he tra is transformed from predator to prey. And then all kinds of evil people take advantage of the narcissist. Psychopaths, gold diggers, I mean, you name it. And this is because he's defenseless. It's reality has been completely destroyed over many, many cycles. That's in a nutshell, the Shetan. Okay. Um, now we'll divide this group to masochists who want to ask questions. <laughs> and say this, who would like to leave the, the world, and this way inflict a novel pain on me. <laughs> Goodbye, say this. <laughs> A brave soul. Yes. I'm going to convert her into the secretary of the <laughs> So vodka, but you know, you get you drink what you get. Yes. How can a view help you and why? Any questions? You shock them. They're yes. speechless. Can I ask a question? You can ask a question? Of course you can ask a question. Okay, I so paid you to ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I want to ask a question about grief after a relationship. If it was such an abusive relationship, then uh, what would you say that uh, people or ab abused one uh, is grieving about. That's precisely what I said. You are not in love with him. You are not in a relationship with him. You are in a relationship with yourself. What you are grieving is yourself. Mm -hmm. You are grieving the lost self-love, the lost capacity to self-love. You are grieving, of course, the shared fantasy. Uh, you are grieving the child, <coughs> like a mother who lost her child. You are grieving a mother. You lost a mother. So, grief after narcissistic abuse is not typical grief. It's what we call prolonged grief disorder. It's not typical grief, but it's four layers of grief, like a wedding cake. <laughs> four layers of grief, and each one of them is very powerful. Is there anything more powerful than losing your child? Mm -hmm. you know? And narcissism gradually becomes more and more your child. And when you lose this child, it's, it's horrible. And then you also lost a mother. Because initially he acted, he truly acted as a mother. Mm. And there was a shared fantasy, which was a refuge, an escape from reality, if you hate reality. And you lost yourself. You finally fell in love with yourself, learned to love yourself, and then it was taken away from you. Because you can love yourself only through the narcissist's gaze and hollow mirrors. Mm. It's not that the narcissist teaches you how to love yourself independently. On the very contrary, it makes you addicted to his gaze. So that whenever you want to fix, when you want to inject, mm -hmm. you know, intoxication of I'm perfect, I'm amazing, I'm ideal, I'm, I'm gorgeous, uh, you go to him, he will tell you. He will tell you what you want to hear about yourself. And that's really addictive. It's intoxicating. It's a wonderful feeling. Love bombing is a wonderful feeling, which is why everyone falls for it. It's known as love bombing. Yeah? Um, he gets the love, you get the bonds. <laughs> it's not as love bombing. So that's that's the reason. You know, it's, these are multiple forms of grief superimposed on each other. And each one of them is possibly the worst kind of grief imaginable. So all four are <laughs> devastating. Yes. Yes, all, uh, all the dynamics of Nazism, as I said at the very beginning, all the dynamics of Nazism are, are built on splitting and another mechanism called projection. Yeah, but also like splitting the 
Yes, yes, you're right. It's a form of speed. So, but all all interactions of the losses and all the dynamics of losses are, are based on splitting and projection. So, for example, it involves not only splitting, but also projection. This analysis makes you all bad, and by implication, he makes himself all good. But he makes you all bad because he is all bad. He projects onto you the parts of him that he rejects, the parts of him that he's ashamed of. So it, it is the narcissist who wants to be aggressive with you. He wants to discard you. He wants to get rid of you. It is he who is planning to do something bad to you. But he cannot admit it. So he projects it onto you. He says, you are the one who is planning to do something bad to me. You're evil. Mm -hmm. When actually he's the one who's planning to... So, there's projection and splitting involved. And yes, he splits you, of course. Mm -hmm. You're all good and then you're all bad. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Yes. I was in the, that kind of a relationship, like from the book, all stages, and it was short. Thanks, God. Because I ran away, but I grieved for two or three years. But I want to ask something. It was almost clear to me what is happening. But I was in desperate feelings and situations before I met him. For three, four years, it was my business relationship between people. I was really desperate. Of, I wanted like, to run away from that situation and to run away from my body. It was so strong wish to run away from that situation. So I ran away straight to, to his arms and all happened, all this addictive uh, idea, everything, everything what you mentioned. So I was questioning myself how this happened to me. But now when you said this loneliness and this before this situation, before I met him, was really hard for me for years. The shared fantasy is a promise that you no longer need to be in reality in order to obtain yes. not in order to obtain outcomes. Mm -hmm. So you can be self-efficacious even when you're not in reality. And it's a promise that all options and alternatives and possibilities will materialize. So like endless promise. Whatever you wish, whatever you dream of, whatever you it will happen. There's a guarantee by the narcissist that it will happen. Mm -hmm. Narcissist, because he feels godlike, projects to you or somehow convinces you that he has the capacity to make anything happen. And everything happen. It's like land of infinite possibilities. You enter a land of infinite possibilities that is not grounded in reality. You don't have to pay the cost, only the benefits. And it's very, very... Um, Captivating, it's very, because who, who wants to be in reality and who doesn't want to be with someone who can instantly realize all your wishes and dreams? And it's this very, helps for shared fantasy, it helps a lot. I really wanted to run away, and, and it happened that I ran away from Croatia to another country. So this shared fantasy, my part, was very strong that I really wanted to run away into this, of course, fantasy. The rest of the story. I think uh, people who find themselves in the shared fantasy with narcissists, I think, that's speculation because there's no more studies, but I think they really hate re their reality. Mm -hmm. They really hate their reality. Even if they don't admit it. But actually they hate their reality. And they sabotage. This is a form of self-harm. Mm -hmm. Trauma bonding, shared fantasy, these are forms of self-harming. So they self-harm because they want to remove themselves from reality. It's like a small child that says, Mommy, I'm sick, I don't want to go to school. So they self-harm. And another thing, they don't believe their capacity to realize their wishes and dreams and fantasies and so on. They don't believe. They don't believe themselves. They don't trust themselves. They, don't. they believe that if they want anything done, it has to be through someone else. It doesn't have to be narcissists. But they always think that the solution will come from the outside somehow. And this is called external locus of control. These are people with external locus of control. They always believe that if they're faced with a, for example, if they have a dream, 
to do something, they need someone to push them. If someone doesn't push them, they, they are static, they are stagnant. And so they, in life, they learn to, to disbelieve themselves, distrust themselves. They're not their, their good friends. They're not their own good friends. They don't have their own back. They don't self-accept, they self-reject. And it, it can deteriorate into self-loathing, and self-harming, and self-trashing, and substance abuse, and it can deteriorate, and it's not stop. And the narcissist comes and tells you, you are so perfect that you deserve all your dreams and wishes to come true, and, and I have the power to do this. Of course, what I'm talking about is a religion. It's a religion, of course. Narcissism is a private religion. It's when the child is small, and helpless and subject to abuse and to trauma, the child makes a choice. He invents a god, that is the false self. It's a deity, it's a divinity, because the false self is all-knowing, all-powerful, perfect, it's a god. So the child invents a god, and then like every primitive god, this god wants human sacrifice. You know, like the Moloch in the Bible, this God wants human sacrifice. So the child sacrifices the only human the child has, himself. The child sacrifices himself to this new God. He sacrifices what is known as the true self. He sacrifices himself to this new God. And then it becomes a religion. There is a God, there is a worshiper, there's been human sacrifice that binds them. Now there's a contract. God must now fulfill the narcissist's wishes and so on because the narcissist gave him everything he had. He, he, even in the Bible, when you make human, when you make sacrifice, not human, it's like a contract with God to appease God, to convince God. To, there's a lot of negotiations with God in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Moses negotiates with God, the fighting with God, uh, Jacob broke uh, God's. I mean, there's a lot of kind of uh, anthropomorphism. <coughs> Narcissism <coughs> is a private, primitive religion invented by a child. That is what narcissism is. And because it's a private religion, and because it's a primitive religion, and because this religion was invented by a child, the narcissist is missionary. He's trying to convert everyone into this religion. And so how to convert you to this religion? He makes promises. Is it different to classical religion? Of course not. God makes you promises. If you believe in him, if you obey the commandments, if you engage in some rituals and ceremonies, and so on and so forth, there are some promises. There's a contract here. No, religion is a shared fantasy. Absolutely shared fantasy. And it's no wonder that God, all gods, are described in narcissistic terms. They're narcissists. Yahweh is a narcissist, Allah is a narcissist. They're all narcissists, I'm sorry to say. The prophets are psychotic, but the gods are not. <laughs> it's a shared fantasy. So, and the narcissist is a private religion. Now, narcissism is threatening to become the biggest global religion. Why? Because unlike other religions, actually unlike most religions, it's distributed. It's a distributed religion. It's like network religion, the internet religion, because you have one God and one worshiper, one God and one worshiper, one God and one worshiper, or one God and ten worshippers, or one God and ten million worshippers. But it's always separate. These are called nodes. These are network nodes. And, but the religion is common. The belief in the false self and the shared fantasy. The rituals and ceremonies of this religion are the same. So it's a distributed religion. There's only one other religion like this, Islam. Islam does not have a central authority. No central authority in Islam, not unlike the Vatican and Catholicism. Islam is a distributed religion. That's a, that's a source of its power. That's why it's the biggest growing religion nowadays. Narcissism is, is growing like mushrooms, and Islam is growing like mushrooms. I'll leave it up to you to make the connection. <laughs> I'll probably be assassinated after I upload it to YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <indeed. laughs> what a way to go. <laughs> what a way to go. <laughs> <laughs> yes, someone want to? Yes. Uh, 
when you were talking about the artistic uh, supply, and um, you said that um, an artist is uh, supplying his himself with uh, when other people adore him, admire him, and etc. When they don't, then he supplies himself. When he doesn't get it from outside, he yes, yes, he, he he does it for himself. But uh, when they don't do it, they actually uh, he then uh, he then can be, uh, become aggressive or uh, mad or and then it's also supplied for him <coughs> when when he, he releases that anger aggression aggression yes that's not exactly supply. Depending, if uh, he terrifies people and so on, yeah, that's supply. But in the vast majority of cases, that's not supply. That's uh, <coughs> a result of narcissistic injury. There are three types of supply. You can get supply from other people. That's primary supply from other people. You can get supply from someone who is close to you, like an intimate partner, who remembers the past supply. So she's like a memory bank, external hard disk and she releases supply when you're not getting it from others. So for example, a narcissist can give a great lecture and be admired by all of you, clearly. And I and, will remember. And my wife has the role to remember this. And I will take photos. To record videos. this. And well, then, he if, will if then if next month, book, you will if next month I will not get supply, yeah, then uh, she will tell me, do you remember the lecture you gave in uh, Zagreb? Wow, you were amazing. You were a genius. But I, I hate to do that. And, <laughs> I, and, I don't, and I don't do it. Yes. That's, That's why, why I devalued you. So, <laughs> so this is secondary supply. This is a form of, of, of uh, regulating the flow of supply. Not having ups and downs, but like regulating it. So when, I, when the masses doesn't get it from outside, the intimate partner or the friend or whoever releases recorded supply, stored supply, so as to stabilize the flow of supply. And the third option is self-supply. Narcissists do self-supply very well mm -hmm. because they, anyhow, they live inside their minds, everything is internal and so on and so forth. They have no difficulty to self-supply, they sometimes create even scenarios where internal objects inside their mind talk to each other and this way create supply. So, for example, paranoid ideation is when you believe that you are the center of some conspiracy. Mm -hmm. So, paranoid is a, paranoia is a form of, of self-supply. Mm -hmm. It's to convince yourself that you are so important, so crucial, so I don't know what, that all, everyone has male malevolent, malign intention, everything is revolving around you, there are plans to destroy you, etc. This is self-supply. Mm -hmm. Paranoid ideation is a form of self-supply and therefore a form of narcissism. Yes. Uh, how do you get rid of the interject? How, I'm sorry? How do you get rid of the interject? How do you get rid of the interject? Yeah. There, are, there are treatment modalities with expertise, with focus on this. So for example, transactional analysis is, is a focus on this. CBT is not so good with this, because CBT deals with uh, the voices of the interject. It deals with the messages, the automatic negative thoughts. So CBT gets rid of sometimes the voices, but the interject is there, so it's not very helpful. But transactional analysis, schema therapy, SCH, EMA, schema therapy is very useful. This to some extent Gestalt, not fully, no, no, to some extent Gestalt. So there are therapies with focus on interjects. Of course, psychoanalysis. But psychoanalysis, you start when you're four years old, and when you're 82, <laughs> the treatment is over, you're over, and, and the therapist is over. <laughs> and you end up in a funeral, and on your tombstone is written, here lies a cured patient. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> we hope. We, 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 ten years more. <laughs> Yeah, we we're in the middle. <laughs> but there was progress. There was progress. Absolutely progress. Uh, psychoanalysis is a, actually a truly powerful methodology, but it's uh, the techniques are very lacking in America, but I don't want to go into this. And um, it's a great pity because when it comes to introduce, for example, it's, 
by far the most powerful uh, system that we have. And of course, all the language comes from object relation schools, which are extension of psychoanalytic and psychodynamic theories. But psychoanalysis itself, as a technique, is more like intellectual pursuit, or intellectual gain. It's not really built to, to produce healing or curing outcomes, not, not in any meaningful sense. Inside this, that you can get to know yourself much better, this for sure. You can get to know yourself much better, but that's not the problem. I know myself perfectly, and I'm a major contributor to the theory of narcissism, so <laughs> awareness and knowledge, <coughs> cognition, is not the same as insight. Insight is transformative, mm -hmm. and for insight to be transformative, you need cognition and emotional correlate. The cognition needs to produce an emotional effect, which will induce change, and this is missing in narcissism. So, uh, if I went to psychoanalyst, we would make great progress. We'll talk about my mother and my father, and, we'll, uh, and I will really learn about myself. I'm not underestimating psychoanalysis, but it will ignore. There will be no so what? zero outcomes. Mm -hmm. Zero outcomes. <laughs> Ne, nema, ne, ne, ne primaju, ne uče, ne mogu da te razumeju šta pričaš, kako da pomogneš da te. I baš mi je a, prijatno da, da, da si toliko učio, da si toliko htio da pomogneš, a onda vidiš, a, ah, ovo je, znaš, ti se osjećaš bedno, posto se ti pitaš, jel sam ja normalna, da sam, jel sam možda postala narkiv. I have to answer your questions. There are several treatment modalities with focus on um, inner voices, introjects and so on. Uh, some of them existentialist therapies. They focus on finding the authentic self, the authentic voice, and then all the others fall away. You have logotherapy, which is a therapy developed by Viktor Frankl, Holocaust survivor. And logotherapy helps you find meaning. And the meaning, but the meaning is linked actually to voices. It's a, it's a voice of meaning. So these are all introject oriented therapies. CBT is very, very useful, but I compare CBT to junk food. It's uh, fast, it's fast, it's uh, effective, super effective. But it doesn't deal with root problem, with core problem. It just changes your programming. So you think differently. And and you act differently. It's very efficient. Not so I'm not underestimating. Of course, there's DBT, dialectical behavior therapy. DBT was developed by a patient, a psychotic patient, when she was in a mental asylum. Another example of a non psychologist at the time. Later, she made a degree in psychology. <laughs> but when she developed DBT, she was not a psychologist, she was a patient. In her 20s, she, had, uh, she was misdiagnosed as a uh, psychotic and this uh, bipolar mm -hmm. and later she understood and others understood that she had borderline personality disorder so she in the asylum she started to develop dbt and it's extremely extremely efficient treatment modality 50 percent of patients with bbt diagnosis lose the diagnosis after one year mm -hmm. in dbt which compared to other <laughs> modalities is uh, amazing by the way, borderline personality disorder has very good prognosis. 81% of people with borderline with BPD diagnosis lose the diagnosis after age 45. Mm -hmm. That's 81%. Which leads us to believe that it is a biological problem. 45. Not a psychological This leads us to believe that it's a biological problem, not a psychological problem. Something in the brain happens, biology change, hormones, hormones, hormones I don't know what, and the disease disappears. Hormones, yes. Uh, uh, psychopathy is also definitely a biological problem, definitely. And there is this hybridity in the in the manuals, in the ICD, International Classification of Diseases, in DSM. There is this hybridity. There are this, <coughs> sorry, there are mental illnesses which used to be included in these books and are still there. Although by now we know for sure that these are not mental illnesses, these are medical conditions. For example, schizophrenia, 
Mm -hmm. uh, but it's still there. And similarly, borderline <coughs> and psych, psych, uh, antisocial, not antisocial, but psychopathy, most clearly are biological. I mean, there's, for example, if you have a first degree relative with borderline personality disorder, your chances to have borderline personality disorder are 500% higher. Mm -hmm. It's a strong indication of her heredity. You know? Of course, psychopath brain is totally different to normal brain. Totally, in every possible way. White, matter, glia, shmia, I mean, you name it. And physiological reactions of psychopaths are different. For example, uh, perspiration and, and heart rate do not increase when the psychopath is experiencing fear or when he's lying. Mm -hmm. And so on. So clearly it's a different animal. Mm -hmm. But um, because of economic reasons, I think, money only, I mean, these were not removed from the DSM. They should not be there. These are biological issues, medical issues, not very different to, I don't know, dementia. Mm -hmm. And dementia is there. <laughs> and why is dementia there? What dementia has to do with mental illness? And for that matter, what psychopathy has to do with mental illness? There's a lot of, and there's a lot of gender bias. A lot of gender bias. For example, to this very day, it's wrongly written that majority of narcissists in, in the DSM-4 text revision, it's wrongly written that majority of uh, narcissists are men, majority of borderlines are women, majority, overwhelming majority of histrionic are women, when the, that's not the reality. 50% of all people diagnosed with NPD are women, 50% of all people diagnosed with BPD are men, and among, in the histrionic group, actually, there's a small majority of men. So there's a lot of gender bias. There's almost been no major, no major figures in psychiatry, female, no major female figures in psychiatry, not psychology, psychiatry. So it's a, it's a work in progress, and there is a lot of pressure to include, to increasingly pathologize and medicalize behaviors. Mm -hmm. So today you have uh, mental illnesses, mental disorders that are connected to caffeine, coffee consumption, internet uh, usage, and I don't know why. I'll give you one parameter. Uh, when I studied medicine, the textbook of internal medicine, like Harris, Harrison's internal medicine, the equivalent. The textbook at the time was about, if I remember correctly, 700 or something pages. That was when the last dinosaurs died, were dying. <laughs> so it was 700 something pages. Today, Harrison, which is the 22nd edition of Harrison's internal medicine, is about 1,300 pages. We learned a lot more. Okay. The first edition of the DSM in 1952 was 100 pages. The current edition, 1952, 70 years ago, uh, the current edition is 1,200 pages. It's like what? We became 12 times more crazy. I mean, what? Yes. What is this? What is this if not, uh, you know, Occam's razor, proliferation of entities? It's, uh, it's wrong. Something's wrong. Absolutely something. In, uh, in this field of diagnostics, and taxonomy, and nosology, something is wrong in, in, in psychology, in psychiatry, in psychiatry especially. And people notice this, so they lose, lose trust in the profession. They lose trust in these professions completely. They notice this, a lot of nonsense going on, a lot of commercial interests, which are not good. Contamination, enormous contamination of the field. The DSM, for example, the committee of the DSM-5, they wanted to rewrite uh, the diagnostic criteria of personality disorders, especially borderline, narcissist, antisocial, and a few others. I don't know. They wanted to rewrite them to reflect current knowledge. And they were not allowed by the insurance companies. And the, they were not allowed. So what they did, if you go to DSM text revision of the links, what did they do? You have like narcissistic personality disorder diagnostic criteria. One, two, three, four, five, nine. Copy pasted from a text which is 25 years old, DSM 4. Copy pasted, nothing changed. We didn't learn anything in 25 years. But at the end, page 767 in the fifth edition, at the end you have alternative model of narcissistic personality disorder where the truth is written, the state of the art, the latest knowledge. Like they're hiding it, it's in the appendixes. <laughs> not to be seen, you know, because they're afraid. Mm. They're simply terrified that they will lose the funding, the grants, the, yeah. 
The ICD is much better. The ICD is, is absolutely cutting edge. It's even, I would say, <laughs> too, too cutting edge. ICD is revolutionary. The latest edition, the 11th edition, yeah. is stunning. Absolutely stunning. I love this book, diagnostic book. And the ICD is used in most of the world. Don't forget the DSM is used in America, yes. Canada, to some extent United Kingdom, together with the ICD, <coughs> not alone, and some parts of Australia, some states in Australia, that's it. Rest of the world, more than 80% of humanity, they don't use this. They use ICD or variants of ICD, like the CCPD is variants of ICD. It's a World Health Organization. The ICD is World Health Organization, so it's a global diagnostic, and it's really good. If you want to learn about cluster B, they, they don't call it cluster B. If you want to learn about personality disorders, go to ICD. Ignore the DSM. DSM is 20, 30 years old. A lot of wrong information. It's disaster. A disaster zone. Except the alternative model, which are very good, but the text itself is horrible. The ICD is, I would say, the knowledge is about five years old, which is great in terms of diagnostic memory. Yeah. Excellent. Let me shoot you. You want to shoot? You <laughs> not want to shoot. <laughs> Shall we go out? <laughs> no, but don't do it. Return, return to me. The prisons in uh, Croatia are hopeless. <laughs> I'm not afraid. Return to me. 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 Return to Defense, defense mechanisms in classic theory are part of the ego. They are connected to the ego. And the ego in the uh, trilateral model of Freud and so on, later on, the ego is partly conscious and partly unconscious. It's not true that the ego is conscious, all conscious. Partly conscious, partly unconscious. Similarly, the superego is part of the ego. And uh, even in later work, the id became part of the ego. Mm -hmm. So it's one thing, and it's partly a conscious, <coughs> partly conscious. However, in Anna Freud's work, Anna Freud is the authority on defense mechanism, much more than the father. So in Anna Freud's work, defense mechanism became automatic, but not unconscious. And not associated with the unconscious. They are like automatic uh, reactions. It's not entirely clear where this automatism comes from. But, for example, your smartphone is automatic, and as far as I check, it doesn't have a, uh, an unconscious. The whole construct of unconscious is very, very debatable. And there have been very many serious uh, thinkers in psychology that disputed the need for the explanatory power of the unconscious. But if we adopt the classic uh, definition of the unconscious and the etiology of the unconscious, the way it was created, then there is no pathway that I can see where the narcissist would have an unconscious. There's no internalization of external voices. There's no, I mean, there's no path that I can see. Even the use of language in narcissism is very compromised. Not overt language, but internal language. It's very compromised. So, as you know, there are schools in psychology, not minor schools, but major schools, which completely dispute the concept of the unconscious. For example, behaviorism. A major school. Social learning theory. There's no place for the unconscious there. So take it with a grain of salt. The unconscious is a 19th century concept which started with Mesmer and all these hypnotists and Breuer developed it and then Freud stole it from him. And even at the time it was highly disputed because at the time it was sexualized. Conscious was perceived as essentially sex related, sexual drives, repression, and, and so on and so forth. And while everyone continued to talk about the unconscious, for example, in object relations theories and so on, uh, if you look into object relations theories, Fairbairn's theories, Gantry, uh, if you look into them, there's no unconscious. 
Fairburn, for example, says that you're born with an ego. You're born with an ego. It's not unconscious. You're born with it. And then life causes the ego to divide in three parts. The libidinal ego, the anti-libidinal ego, is the central ego. So it, there's no trace of the unconscious in Fairbairn's work. Even though he uses the term ego, which theoretically is part of the unconscious, he doesn't use the construct of unconscious for any, anything theoretical. And Fairbairn is not a minor figure. Not a minor figure. Similarly, someone like Winnicott, also. We didn't, we didn't mention, I mean, we, of course they all mentioned the unconscious, but there's no role for the unconscious there. He talked about the false self, the true self, and so on and so forth. But there's no role for the unconscious. I think the unconscious lost its role more or less in most of the world in the 30s and in France in the 60s. France is always 30, 40 years behind. So Lacan, <laughs> Lacan was the last guy that kind of contributed to the theory of the unconscious, and that was the end of it. Uh, but be that as it may, if you wish to use this language element, I think unconscious is a language element. I don't think it has any, any validity. If you wish to use this, then it doesn't apply to narcissism. That's all I'm saying. So before everybody leaves, I just want to say a few words. I would like to thank Professor Sam Wagner for this interesting lecture. And uh, I would like to thank you for uh, helping me all these months before we met, <laughs> because I was listening to your lectures uh, online. Uh, it's a great source of knowledge, the YouTube channel. And uh, I'm happy that uh, I, I contacted prof Professor, and uh, he was very kind to answer. So he said that he's coming to Croatia. And then uh, we arranged the lecture, and uh, Tihana was a great help because it was in such a short notice that she managed to uh, gather you all here and find a place for the lecture. So, so blame her. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, thank you for coming. Thank you, Tihana, for organizing.